the the point is to not just jump to what it is that you think your partner needs but rather ask maybe say what what are you looking for here or for you to tell your partner hey all that i need from you right now is this and it, again it is that meta communication it's that really simple way of just putting out there into the world this is what i'm looking for and this is what i would like to have Welcome back to Open Late Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Spandiari, and today I have with me the trio from Multiamory who co-authored the book, Multiamory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. We've got Jace, Dedeker, and Emily here, so we're going to try to... They just schooled me on the traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to point to ourselves before we start uh -huh. talking which I think is also an excellent communication yeah, stuff tool. that you, you pick you up go. in like nine years of podcasting, which again, in the podcasting world is basically 200 years. Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, the fact that you guys started this in 2014, right? Your show, um, which is interesting because that's back when my non-monogamy journey oh. started. Mm. Oh, wow. But I was so... Um, like not open and not out and not public about my life that I never looked for any resources. Oh. I was just like, this is this taboo little piece of my life that we're not going to talk about with anybody. But then once I started to open up, Multiamory was the first podcast I found. Oh. And so I've been a listener for about three, oh, four great. years. Oh, so nice. glad to know that. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that you share that because I don't think you're not the first person I've heard something like that from where there's almost like this assumption of isolation, this assumption of like, this is so weird mm. and so deviant and there's no way that there's anyone out there who's doing the same thing. Or if they are, they're probably weirdos. And I don't know if I want to connect with them, you know, just kind of like, we just kind of got to keep this to ourselves and figure it out as we go along. Like there's actually a lot of people out that, there who mm -hmm. I think feel that way right out the gate. I think so too. And that was a hundred percent my internal dialogue. And it's what I hear from a lot of people who find open mm. late. And now when they reach out to me, I think to myself and I tell them there's so many resources, you know, and I list, you know, the eons yeah. of which feel mm -hmm. like a ton, but it, it's still such a small amount. I think we know when you compare it to, you know, the billions of podcasts yes. that are <laughs> <Right>. out there. <laughs> I'm just curious, how do you kind of navigate a journey without resources, a, a non-monogamous journey? Do you just sort of trial and error and figuring it out as you go along? Yeah. I mean, wow. it was, it wasn't a big focal point in our lives mm. that we wanted to explore. And lucky for us, when we started opening up, we did it with a close friend. Mm -hmm. And so it was just sort of this threesome dynamic that happened and then when that ended, there was another threesome dynamic that started. And then we found Cassidy mm -hmm, <laughs> online, mm -hmm. which is like a Facebook for, you know, open right. lifestyle, non-monogamy. We did that for a minute. And then, and then eventually I was like, wait, there has to actually be a podcast <laughs> about this. Um, but yeah, it is, it's quite isolating. And I think you know, as you've all been on this journey for a while, there's so many ways to do that. Sure. Yeah. And so that is so funny that you highlight how it feels like there's a ton of resources and it's true, especially compared to 10 years ago, so many more resources at all scales, right. Of both, you know, published books, podcasts, um, all the way down to just like, you know, kind of small to medium sized, just content creators, or even just people on TikTok Blogs. who are just like, I'm just going to talk about my non-monogamous life in an informal way. Right. So it can feel like there's tons of resources. And then also at the same mm -hmm. time, not nearly enough, right. Not nearly enough. Like we not got nearly the enough. hits, you know, we got the books that get passed around and the podcasts that get passed around and it's still not nearly enough, especially compared to when you think about the huge body of books, TV shows, programs, therapy training schools that, you know, that cater to mainstream monogamous, married, heterosexual relationships. Like we got a lot of lost time. We got a lot of space to fill as it were. Absolutely. And if you think about the way that, you know, and not just non-monogamy, but all forms of non-traditional styles of relating are really starting to boom and people are like, wait, I don't have to do this. I don't have to be in the box of, you know, one size fits all. There is such a demand. And if you, 
I mean, if you think about it, as you're saying, even just like health and wellness as like an umbrella or like relationships, period. We definitely are ready for, we're ready for more books <laughs> like this. <laughs> and actually, I just want to highlight this before we dive in. The best thing about this book and the best thing I think about your podcast too, is it's not just for people who are into non-monogamy or practicing polyamory or whatever. It's really anyone in any relationship style is going to benefit from reading this book and learning the tools that you have cultivated through your podcast and your listeners, it, it seems like, as I'm starting to dive into the book, who have written in and said, okay, this is what's going on for me. And now I'm starting to, as a new podcaster, I'm like, oh, duh, <laughs> this like, it, I don't want to say that like your book wrote itself because I know I can only imagine how much has gone into this, but that's actually my first question is when did this book start almost forming itself via your episodes and your listeners and how, like, how was that whole process to be like, Oh my God, this is the book here. Take that one, Jace. Yeah. So this was something that we'd kind of talked about for years before it actually became real. Uh, and I think two things coincided. So one was that a listener of ours actually reached out who's a literary agent and said, Hey, you mentioned something on an episode about writing a book, uh, I'm an, I'm an agent. I've been doing this for 10 years. Would you want to meet up and chat about it? And so that happened. And then also we had a goal on our Patreon of once we hit a certain number of patrons that we would do something. And so we put a poll out to our audience of like, what should that something be? And the book was the thing that won, uh, that the most people wanted. And so we began that process. And now this started in 2019 when we first started putting together book proposals and outlines and working with our agent. Actually, we ended up with two agents, so we're poly agentary as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, no better yeah. way to be. There you go. worked with our agents on putting this together. And actually, the book took on a lot of different shapes before it became the book that it is. Uh, you know, we played around with different ideas of, is it focused on just one tool or is it trying to cover like everything we've talked about in the last, you know, eight or nine years of podcasting and ended up landing on this one, which was taking the tools that we've made on the show that have gotten the most use, I guess, like that we've seen the most people respond to saying, oh my gosh, this one really changed things for me, or this one saved my relationship, or this one helped me get out of a bad relationship or whatever it is that we kind of looked at what, what are those top ones that we reference the most often that get used with clients that uh, listeners of ours who are therapists or counselors tell us they recommend the most to their clients. So those are the ones that we ended up putting together into the book. Mm. And so it was always going to be more or less a communication tools. Yeah. yeah. And, and as you've you know read in our intro chapter, we tried to be very explicit about the fact that this isn't another non-monogamy 101 book. It's not another how-to book. Those books already exist. Um, you know, we maybe we could have written that book, but we're like, it already exists. And I don't know if we necessarily have a perspective to add to that that hasn't already been covered. But it's sort of hoping that this can start to enter a little bit of that non-monogamy 201 space. And again, we've tried to write it in such a way that it's inclusive and accessible to people in as many of different types of relationship styles as possible. But yeah, it's kind of going beyond just trying to explain like these are your options and more of like, here's how you're going to make some shit work, actually, <laughs> you know, like because it's inevitable that whether you're in a triad or you're just trying to get a threesome or maybe you're just solo poly or maybe you want to find your monogamous married soulmate or whatever it is, you're going to run into some communication mishaps. And so here are some tools that you can use to hopefully just increase the quality of your relationships, whether you have one relationship or 10 relationships. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It, I was at dinner last night with some friends and we were actually talking about how um, just different communication styles and tools and things that you would learn in like a business context, um, but you're never really learning in a personal context unless you go to like a workshop on mm -hmm. communication or a lot of times like a leadership course, like a big coaching course is going to teach you how to like communicate and 
give and receive feedback mm-hmm. and, you know, repair, you know, after there's been damage. Um, but I, I think that these are the most valuable communication tools because everything boils down to relationships. Mm-hmm. And th- I, I just really love how you start with uh, meta communication as the first one. You know, I'm like looking at this, like this is so basic and, but I'm reading it and I'm like, I don't do this. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. This is something so many people that don't. Yeah. it's, and it's wild to like, think about how many, uh, how many points in my life where I'm either with my husband or other partners or even friends or in a business sense where I could be way more effective if at the very beginning I'm like, Hey, here's what I'm like looking for from this. You know, I'm, I either just need an ear. I want to vent, you know, um, <laughs> communicating about how you're communicating. So I was really stunned because I think that for someone who prides themselves on being a great communicator, there's still so much to learn. And that was like, hands down, I thought my favorite tool, but then I kept reading. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got halfway through to like uh, the check-in or the mm-hmm. checkup. And um, I, I definitely want to hear from the three of you. We chatted about this earlier. So I would love for you to share what your favorite tools are from the book. Um, you can pick who goes first and then we can kind of dive in and give the listeners a little insight to what to expect. Yeah, I'll jump right in with that tool that you were describing before, which we call the Triforce of Communication. Triforce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It, that one probably is the one that I think all three of us use on almost a daily basis because it's so easy to utilize with just about anyone in your life. And essentially, it's three different ways of communicating and just essentially telling the person who you're communicating with what you need out of the conversation. So immediately it's, you know, I just want to put something out there into the world. I have something that's, you know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of rough right now and this is why and I just want to put it out there. I don't need anything from you. I just want to tell you. And that's the first Triforce, the first way of communicating. And then the second way is you come home perhaps from a hard day at work and you're really looking for some love and support from your partner. And so all that you're asking from them is I just want, you know, care. I want cuddles. I want poor baby, something along those lines. And that's Triforce number two. And then the third one is the one that I think so many people jump to immediately when their partner is having a distressing moment or when something is going on and that's to give advice. So the the point is to not just jump to what it is that you think your partner needs, but rather ask, maybe say, what what are you looking for here? Or for you to tell your partner, hey, all that I need from you right now is this. And it, again, it is that metacommunication. It's that really simple way of just putting out there into the world, this is what I'm looking for and this is what I would like to have. Yeah. And if I can just add to what I really appreciated was in your description and in your adding, you know, sort of each of your stories and maybe what your listeners have written in about, um, with this tool, I noticed too, it's like, it can develop. Like Mm -hmm. you can start saying like, I just want to vent. And then it's okay then to say, you know what? I actually feel like I might need a solution here. Can we then shift and focus on that now that I feel like I've gotten whatever it is off my chest? Because I know that that happens for me a lot. I don't always know Mm -hmm. what I want, Mm -hmm. especially with my partner. And so it's such a beautiful tool to like go in and ground myself and say, okay, I'm not sure what I want. So I'm going to start here, but I'm open to it changing. Yes, exactly. And I I was like, okay, these can I love that because, yeah, especially if you're upset, confused, stressed out, if you have 600 things on your mind and your partner does ask, okay, what do you want right now? It, it can be hard, right? Maybe you know it right away, right? But often we don't. And so, yeah, when I'm in those situations, sometimes it is a, let's start with a T3. Let's start with problem solving. And then I'll let you know if that feels like that's right. And maybe we'll shift gears halfway through. Something that's been really beautiful is, you know, we've been talking about the Triforce of Communication on our show for a long time. And our listener community has picked it up and run with it, specifically our Patreon community. So 
in our private Facebook groups or our private Discord where people come to talk about relationship issues, talk about what's going on in their lives, people will use that same system where they'll be like, hey, this is what's going on with me and my partner. I don't want problem solving. I just want T2. I just want sympathy, empathy, to be told poor baby. You know, I just want comfort, right? Or maybe someone will post, say, hey, this is what's going on. I want problem solving specifically. I want to hear from people who have been in this situation before and what you did to get out of it, right? And I think that having that sort of built into the listener culture has made our communities, I think, so much more supportive and nicer spaces to be in Mm. than most of the internet and especially most of the like polyamory support group internet. Of course, like, you know, in any community space, you're going to run into tension and conflict and things like that. But it's a space that, you know, we have a wonderful team of moderators who don't often have to do very much because I think people are able to really clearly ask for what they want and people know what what kind of responses to give. Right. And so then I get thrown off when I go into any other space on the internet, like, you know, months ago when I post a question on the like learning Japanese subreddit, you know, and like asking for, Hey, I'm looking for this particular resource. Does anyone have recommendations? And all these people swoop in with like, well, really you should be thinking about this. Well, I don't know. Well, I thought it was funny that you said this. Well, I, you know, I'm just like, no, no, that's not what I'm here for. Right. And I I, like so much of that, I think could help resolve some of our interpersonal conflict, even in this weird like medium where we're dealing with mostly strangers on the internet. Absolutely. And it's, it's so interesting because as, as you're sharing, I'm thinking about, wow, look at a lot of these two to think about how I want to you know, interact better with my partner and the people in my life. And I know that a lot of people come to like my show, for example, because they're interested in non-monogamy and they want to learn how to communicate that with their partner. But what I think people struggle with most into something we were talking about earlier is actually how to communicate about their relationship choices to the people that don't understand Mm. their relationship choices. And so I think, you know, the four of us, we have experience in, in non-monogamy, whether it's like long-term or I think I know, Emily, you're in a monogamous container now, mm-hmm. but the hardest part is when you're swimming in a sea full of monogamy and mononormativity and you just want to share a relationship issue and then you're being told like, well, it's because you're in an open relationship. That's something my listeners yeah. write to me about every day. And I think that this tool can help so much with people to be like, Hey, you know, (laughs) I know that we have very different relationship styles. What I'm looking for right now is not a solution, just an ear, just a great listener, or, you know, help me navigate this if that's what you want, but you have the power to ask for what you want in your communication. Yes. And I think that's part of the reason why this community is so ravenous for resources, you know, like more books, more podcasts, all of those things is, you know, all of the mainstream resources don't necessarily speak to us. Often they ignore us, often they vilify us, often they pathologize us. And kind of the same with when you're reaching out to get help, whether it's from a friend or from a therapist, even people who are very well-meaning just don't know, right? And so, you know, pointing at you doing something weird and anormative with your relationship structure is like the low hanging fruit. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's really just a lack of like, like you're saying education too. I, I often remind people like, I don't think your friend means you any harm. It's just scary because they have no idea. So yeah, it's just easy to be like, Oh, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, it's something yeah. that we often recommend to people when they're starting out is to, you know, find some kind of community. And that's sometimes hard to do, depending where you live, especially. But finding a good online community is difficult. And that's why we're so happy with ours, because, you know, we see a lot better behavior there than in a lot of the internet. Uh, So that's a challenging thing to do. But I find that in person is often better because we tend to be less shitty to each other face to face than we are online. <laughs> and so something that that I often recommend to people is look into communities in your area not to date. Maybe you'll get there eventually, but yeah. just go to places to meet people and make friends and to just have a space, some space in your life where you can talk about your relationships and what you want where 
the question isn't why would you want to do that or that's going to be bad or won't you be jealous or kind of the typical questions and instead you'll get the more meaningful questions of okay well you know how are you going about approaching that or is that the best way to communicate about it or oh we do it this other way that's different and so you can get a sense of how other people are doing it what are they doing that you don't like what are they doing that you do like just to get that sense because we don't have that built in like you're mentioning right your friends don't get it and so they can't get past that first you're doing a weird thing step to even give you any meaningful feedback so that's something that if you can find it online great you know i'll recommend our community obviously but if you can find it in person that's yeah. that's an awesome place so trying to find those events that are not just about dating where you're also connecting with people and discussing yeah. We're definitely going to link your community in the show notes. Most people listening know we do have a small WhatsApp. Um, well, it's not small, actually. And it seems like we will have to move to a Discord mm -hmm, mm -hmm, soon enough mm -hmm. because WhatsApp is just not like, it's not meant for, for what size. I think is yeah. happening yeah. now yeah. In, yeah. in open talks. Um, but one more point that I want to add, and then we could move on to the rest of the favorite tools. But it's so interesting. I'm sitting here. I'm hosting a dinner at my home tonight. Um for a group called Open Social that I just joined and it's the first dinner. And I'm like 10 years into non-monogamy. This is the first time that I'm actually going to be in a space that's not meant for dating, that's not meant for mm -hmm. play. Um, and so it's just so funny because you're saying wow. find the communities that there's like no pressure. You're not like there to hook up with anybody. And I'm just now realizing how important that is that like, Pasha and I just wow. <laughs> last month wow. and we're doing it for the first time, but it is, it's so true. We, we need community around these things. And I think if that had been more of a focal point in our lives, we would have done it sooner, but you know, there's no time. <laughs> sure. yeah. Well, so. so excited to hear how that is <laughs> Absolutely. for you. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you know. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be fun dinner party. I was, they were looking for a place to host and that's why they hadn't put one on the schedule um yet and I was like a little eager I'm like when's it gonna be and they were like well, we're looking for a, a home that's big enough and I was like I have a home that's <laughs> nice. big enough great that's great <laughs> don't even know these great. people yeah why that's, not yeah. diving with both feet that's a great example though of of the people who say oh you know there's not a community in my area or something is maybe you need to be the one to start it so or to host it or right. something yeah. right it reinvigorates some old meetup group that's you know fallen into disuse <laughs> or whatever yeah. Yeah. All right. Who's next? I think you're next, Jace. Sure. Yeah. I think for me, the one I'll go with is it's so hard to choose, right? It's choosing between all my babies. Uh, but I would say <laughs> all your children, yeah, I'd say the radar check-in that you kind of teased that you had just gotten to that chapter. Um, but the, the check-in uh, we call it radar and that uh, little acronym for kind of the steps that you go through when doing this. But the the key part of it is that it's a regular relationship check-in that you would do. We recommend around once a month, but some, some people we talk to do it weekly for a little while, especially if they're just opening a relationship or have a lot more stuff they need to communicate about. Sometimes maybe a few months go by between radars, you know, however it is you find the right the right pace for you. But the idea is that there's a structure to the check-in. And so you're talking about all these different areas of your relationship and also your personal lives and sharing that with each other. And what I love about it is that it takes away that stress of there's something I need to talk about. When am I going to do it? That nervousness of like, how do I bring this up? Well, do I tell them this morning that I want to have a talk later tonight, knowing that then they're going to be stressed out about it all day, wondering what I want to talk about. Or, you know, anytime I say I want to have a talk, the association is, oh, that's going to be bad. This is going to be stressful. You have a complaint. What I love about it is that it helps to take away some of those because in it, you talk about the stuff that's going well. You talk about stuff that's challenging, things you want to bring up future plans, maybe just, hey, we want to try this new sex thing or like, hey, you know what? I want to schedule time so that we can swipe on the apps together or let's plan our next trip or, hey, you know, 
this has been getting on my nerves lately and I don't want this to be a thing. So I figured we'd bring it up here so we can just talk about solutions together, however you want to approach it. And I think one of the things that's been so magical for me about it is knowing it's coming up takes away that pressure to be like, I'm upset right now. I need to like make a whole thing out of it. It's like, sure, if something happens, you can talk about it in the moment. But if it's going to be a bigger discussion, you can also think, you know what? I know we've got one planned on the calendar for two weeks from now. Let me make a note for myself and then I'll remember to talk about it then. And often in a couple of weeks when you do end up talking about it, you're a lot more calm. Maybe you're less upset than you were. You know, I've had ones where I wrote like pages of angry notes to myself about what I wanted to talk about. And then on the day, it was just a little five minute, you know, hey, this was going on for me and, and this is what I would like. And I think this would make it better. I was upset at the time, but I realized it's not as big a deal as I thought it was. And so it can be really helpful for tackling both big and small things like that without it being this stress of when to do it. Yeah. I remember actually when I was, this was what I got to, I was reading the book last night and I was like blown away by the statistics in this chapter. And I, I had a post-it note in there, but it's gone. So I don't know what page it's on, but I think it was something like wild, like 96% of in like some study mm. when it looked at a relationship check-in it was like 96 percent of people who reported completing their check-ins mm. i think mm. like the whole way and you'll have to correct me if i'm wrong but showed 65 percent like <laughs> in improved intimacy or yeah. something you're gonna you're gonna have <laughs> yeah. to like, reel yeah, me in so please you- but i remember being like this is crazy like why are we not mm-hmm. all doing this mm-hmm. yeah it's so funny because i've also started to see this this idea of having a regular relationship check-in start to pop up a little bit across the internet in different forms so i mean it's been really cool that like we've seen people kind of take our radar formula and spread it around and apply it in all their different communities and relationships and stuff like that. But like, I feel like I'm starting to see this come into the zeitgeist. Yeah. I'm shocked at how many like different people have started to say like, Oh, relationship check-in. This is a new revolutionary (laughs) idea. And I'm like, uh, it's been around <laughs> since 2017. So well, <laughs> sure, has, but yeah. at least ours, I mean, has, ours but, has. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, it's, it's so fascinating. Um, cause I, I don't know, I think that we are starting to see at least more of a push. And I think this, this is all included in the same wave of more people being interested in non-traditional relationships. I think it's part of this bigger wave of maybe more people of our generation being interested just in intentional relationships and mindful relationships. Not that that solves all of our problems or makes everything perfect, but I do think, you know, the relationship check-in formula has become a little, is starting to become a meme. At least that's what I feel like I'm seeing from my perspective, because I do think people are interested in like, how do we just like not repeat all the messed up patterns that we saw our parents' generation go through, you know, how do we find ways to actually connect on a regular basis and like take care of our relationship health from this sort of meta perspective. Right. Now, as someone who's been in a relationship long term, um, you know, like 10 years, I I can hear myself and also people listening probably think, well, things are going really smooth. And, you know, we don't have like a lot of times I'll get asked about boundaries with Pasha and I, and they're so like, almost subconscious for us, or we don't really have them. We have like agreements and you know, our commitments to each other, but our relationship is very fluid and we have very few check-ins. I know what would be the benefit if we did it more frequently. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would love to hear, you know, from your point of view, like what can come up and what, why should people do it? Even if they're like, yeah, things are great. We're good. We don't need to like sit down and talk about it. I think even if you know a person extremely well, you can never fully know exactly what's going on with them internally and their wants and desires and needs for maybe something new and exciting in the relationship. Even if things are going great, it it gives you the opportunity to just check in and really have a moment to sit there and think like, hey, yeah, I would like to try this new thing. Or I have been wanting to go on a trip with you, or I think 
we've been getting a little stale at night just sitting, you know, on the couch watching Ted Lasso every single <laughs> week. And I wanted I'd switch it up a little bit. I think from that perspective, it is great to get the opportunity to do that. And and our lives change so much over time, especially if you're with someone for a really long period of time. You go through moments of like we have ailing parents. We have kids now that are growing up and we need to sit down and really be able to talk about what's going on in their lives. Or, you know, I I have something internally that's going on in my mental health or my physical health. And I'd love to be able to talk to you about that instead of just bringing it up at any old time when I'm about to run out the door or whatever. It really gives you a moment and it's sort of a beautiful ritual to get the opportunity and, and give yourself as a couple or as multiple people, the opportunity to do that. Yeah. I, I think that mm. even if you feel like everything's good and everything's fine, you know, at the very least still covering a topic where you feel like everything is great, gives you an opportunity to high five each other, right. To <laughs> even be like, awesome. Like when we check in about money, let's say to use an example, like things are great. Like that's so cool. What do you think has helped us with that? Is there something that we might be hoping to do next when it comes to our financial situation or things like that? Um, so it's, so I, I really like doing this with specifically the couples that I work with, that when people tell me, oh yeah, things are fine. We haven't really gotten into any conflict since the last time we saw you. I want to dive into that be like, that's awesome. Why? why haven't you had any conflict? What's mm. led to that? Like, you know, who communicated in a different way? Like who, you know, like I do think also even understanding why things are working well really helps. And to check in on that and repeat mm. that can really help to actually get that more encoded in your body and in your brain. And then with other topics, for instance, something like sex, you know, Jace touched on that as an example a little bit. I think about with a topic like sex, even if you feel like we have really, really good sex in our relationship, if you want to try something different, when is the time to bring that up? Because sometimes in the middle of sex, if you're in the middle of sex and you're suddenly like, I want to try butt stuff and the other person is caught off guard, maybe they weren't expecting this. And now like, oh God, do we ruin the mood? Or do I have to just like say yes, because now we're in the mood, even though I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. Or do I do it over dinner? Like, hey, I want to do butt stuff. You know, so, so it's like something about creating this ritualistic time and space to be able to check in on these things, even if things are feeling good. I know for me, even in extremely healthy, wonderful, close relationships, I really love the check-in time. It's not always great. Like, cause yeah, you get into conflict or you get into uncomfortable conversations or sometimes it's like, Oh, right. We need to figure out when we're going to go see your mom. Let's talk about that. Right. Um, but I just love having that sense of closeness of that sense of like we're caring for our relationship and we're creating time just to talk about our relationship. We're creating this time where we get to be totally self-absorbed about our relationship in service of helping this feel better for everyone involved. So even when things are great, like I still love having a check in. One piece I want to add that specifically on the non-monogamy note is that something that's often challenging is like, when do I update you about other dates that I've been on or how I'm feeling about my different relationships or if I'm thinking about dating or, or what, like when, when do we do that update? Is it as soon as I get home from the date? Is it just randomly? Is it now it's weird that some time's gone by and we haven't talked about it, that that's one of the topics in a radar is talking about your other partners and also close friends, you know, kind of any significant other people in your life um, to kind of have this moment where, okay, yeah, what's, is there anything else that's happened that we haven't talked about yet to make sure that there's this regular time to check in and get updated about those things, I think is, again, is like another one of those ways to take off that pressure of trying to figure out when and what do I say, you know, how do, how do I present this information? It's like, oh yeah, we've got a time for it. And maybe it's something urgent you yeah. should bring up sooner, but at least you have this regular check-in as well. Mm, I love that. You you both hit on two of the things that in my mind, you know, when I'm asking the question, I'm like, <laughs> I know why it would be so beneficial for us and, and why we've added a lot more of them in the last year. Um, but it's A, so things don't slip through the cracks because mm -hmm. um, on the flip side of like what you were 
kind of talking about and demonstrating, it's like, when do you bring it up? And you might just like blurt it out at not the best time. I know for me, I will just not bring it up. And then things kind of, you know, our lives move very quickly. We both have businesses and travel a lot. And so there's just so much of the time things slip through the cracks or fall by the wayside and then never get brought up and don't get handled or will build in the background, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And then I I loved what you said, Dedeker. For me, it's like the reminder that the relationship is like its own organism, Mm -hmm. you know, and we can take that for granted, you know, speaking for myself and and Pasha, but I think a lot of people do that when things are great, um, but they could be like, magnificent but they're just like they're autopilot amazing you know don't like it's not broke don't fix it kind of mentality really takes away from that like oh this is my relationship like let me nurture it and let me water it and all of the things you know that are necessary to see it really thrive um so i i like love what you both shared yeah and then built into the process you know the last r of radar stands for reconnect so it's like after we get through this process of checking in together, which can be scary, can be uncomfortable, can be exciting, can be arousing, can be all those things in the same conversation, that we reconnect at the end. We share appreciation for each other or we touch each other or we decide like, ooh, let's go treat ourselves to a nice meal or let's have sex or let's give each other massages or whatever so that we start to build this association that when we check in, it's not just a drag. You know, when it's, hey, let's talk about our relationship. Let's take care of our relationship. It's it's not a slog, you know, that it feels good at the very end. And we can reward ourselves for getting through something that, that can be hard and can be challenging. Mm, so beautiful. All right. Well, that brings us back yes. still to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dedeker, what is your favorite It is hard tool? to pick. Um I really enjoy our microscripts tool, which the easiest way to describe microscripts is, you know, the researchy term is it's harnessing the power of idiosyncratic language in your relationship in order to interrupt kind of default, um, less than savory communication patterns. And what that looks like in real life is just kind of like making up a bunch of in-jokes to get you through tough times, you know, or to get you through a conversation that would normally turn into an argument, right? So we give a bunch of examples of this in the book. One example that I really love is actually one that we borrowed from Phoebe Phillips, who runs the blog Polyamoring. And she shares this microscript that she came up with her partner. And it was kind of in service of making sure that in their non-monogamous relationship, they were generating a culture where it's safe for everyone to be honest. Again, this kind of piggybacks off of what Jace was talking about, you know, the trickiness of sometimes disclosing information in a non-monogamous relationship. And she describes how, you know, like she works with a lot of people where it's like someone has something to share and maybe it's something like, oh yeah, I did end up hooking up with that person or I have a date on Friday or I'm so sorry, I need to move around our date plans because my other partner, you know, has these plans, you know, so any kind of information that could elicit a response, everything from a totally neutral response to a negative response and the person that you're telling, right? And so sometimes what happens with a lot of people is they can get in this pattern of, okay, so I share with you, yeah, I had sex with that person. You feel like, I see that you feel uncomfortable. Maybe you have a bad reaction. Maybe you kind of pout. Maybe you have some emotions come up. And so then I feel more disincentivized to be forthright and honest with you. So maybe I hold on to that information for longer. And then when I do tell you that it's a bigger reaction. And so like, this is a pretty common cycle that I think especially people who are new to non-monogamy can get into. And so the microscript that Phoebe came up with with her partner was like, okay, if my partner tells me something, all I say back to them is thank you for your honesty. And that's it. That's the script that we follow. And maybe it's thank you for your honesty. And then I go excuse myself to go to the bathroom and like take a 20 minute walk to kind of cool down and let the emotions go through and then come back to the conversation. But the whole idea behind it was like literally just a script to follow that helps get us past the the kind of rough patch, the kind of default emotional conditioning, the default communication pattern and gets us to the other side of it so that then we can communicate in the way that we want. And this is a tool that I use with my clients all the time, like all the time, especially my relationship with 
Jace that if we kind of identify like, wow, we've had the same argument like three times now, right? Or, oh, we've we've had the same weird little interchange like three or four times now and we, we're not really enjoying this. Is there a microscope that we can come up with that just cuts to the shorthand of like what I want to convey to you and what you want to convey to me, right? So that the next time this comes up, we can just follow that script and kind of get past this moment and then move on with our lives. So I really love microscripts because the fact that they're so customizable and to me it feels like I don't know it feels like I've been given a Swiss army knife for relationship issues which that's a bold claim um, that's a really bold claim but I don't know I just if I it makes me feel so empowered that like I can collaborate with my partner with any kind of conversation where we tend to get stuck or it tends to be repetitive that we can be like let's try something else that's going to be a circuit breaker to get us past this and then see what it's like on the other side. Mm, mm-hmm. A circuit breaker. Mm-hmm. I love that. Now, is there, um, are you going in at, like after the microscript and after the that m- communication has happened and maybe you take some time, is it okay to like reopen the conversation or the whole purpose mm, is sure. like, this is all we're going to, Mm-hmm. Okay. No. It, yeah, of course. It's it's all like always it's going to be on the table. So this is not in service of like shutting down the conversation necessarily, but it's kind of like giving us a chance to reboot a little bit. Right. Mm. Like Jace, we ha- didn't we have one a while ago that was about work schedules and stuff like that. Do you remember what I'm referring to? Right. Yeah. It was that whenever I would tell you that I had some kind of a work call or something that was later in the evening, you'd kind of get upset feeling like I was working too much. And I would try to reassure you like, no, it's, it's okay. I just want to be sure I get this done. I want to be supportive of my coworkers, whatever it was. And we found that this conflict came up several times where I'd say, oh, by the way, tonight, you know, after dinner, I'm going to do a call for a little bit with a coworker. And I'd see her, you know, react and get kind of upset on my behalf, right? But it, you know, stressed me out. And so it was no good. So the microscript we came up with that was, I was like, hey, if I said I was hanging out with a friend, it, you wouldn't have that same reaction, even though like the result on you would be the same and our lives would be the same. So what if our microscript is if I ever say, oh, and you know, tonight after dinner, I'm going to have a call with Billy Bob Thornton. For some reason, he was <laughs> the one we came up Billy with. So and <laughs> yes. I was like, oh, yeah, I've got a, I just got a quick thing with Billy Bob. Don't worry about it. Like, I'll do that after dinner. <laughs> and then I could just be like, great, enjoy your time with Billy Bob instead of having right. my whole reaction, right, of just like, oh, you're working, okay. And like, maybe I could still have the feelings, right, of like, oh, he's working, oh, that's a disappointment, right? But at least in the moment, I don't have to like, we don't have to make it a problem necessarily. Mm. Now, if this was a chronic issue, right? If I felt continually, oh my God, he's constantly working in the evenings. We're running out of time. We don't have quality time together. That's a great radar topic, right? To be like, by the way, I'm a little concerned. Let's talk about this, right? So it's not like it puts it off the table, but at least it doesn't have to derail our night, right? Where he's, it's kind of for like smaller Mm -hmm. little issues that are quirky that might hurt a little bit or I mean that we all laughed at the idea of Jace like going off and having a good time with Billy Bob Thornton (laughs) so it's just sort of a funny thing that you know you remember oh yeah okay haha have fun Mm -hmm. Jace or do your thing or it's all good you know it it sort of can elicit that a more positive response as opposed to immediately a negative on your part right yeah yeah you're actually bringing back bringing me back to how I think you prefaced it or how you started the chapter, it's like, these are the tiny little things that are nothing that actually turn into a big Mm -hmm. conflict. It's like, you know, can you do the dishes? I don't like how you said that. (laughs) But I love it because when you were sharing your very personal example, I'm like, are you in my head? Because that's something that Pasha and I will sort of have that all the time when I notice that he has like things on his calendar that are work related in the evening after dinner. I'm always like, mm-hmm. why mm-hmm. You shouldn't work that mm-hmm. late? You know, in my, I start my story of like how this isn't healthy mm-hmm. and it's so mm-hmm. minor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really appreciate that. Billy Bob. Thornton. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can be friends with Billy Bob Thornton too. Take that one. Take that one. Right. Around with there it. You go. <laughs> he would be a great person to <laughs> hang out with after dinner. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Well, Thank you for sharing your faves. I really appreciate it. I 
it's it's so great to also hear in your voices because I've been listening to you, you know, off and on for years now. So I think I read in oh, your yeah. voices. Oh, yeah, perfect. Mm. Good. Um, <laughs> You know, but to like hear which ones are your favorite and to help people understand going a little bit deeper into each topic is awesome. And also like how to not use them, which, which we just touched on as a way to like avoid, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you even say that in the beginning of the book, like a lot of these things could actually be used negatively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can like use them as manipulation tactics. And I don't think anyone, you know, listening or, or reading this book is, intending to do that but it is it's it could be a slippery slope right it's easy to do when you feel like you have all the information sure yeah (laughs) yeah definitely (laughs) and I think that I don't know I I think we see this with a lot of things like I mean I think we talked about this a little bit in our chapter on boundaries I think we especially see this in the non-monogamous community where boundaries can actually be bludgeons (laughs) in practice you know, in the sense that it's like, you know, boundaries can actually be really punitive and we can just call it a boundary and therefore that means it's okay, right? Because right now, culturally, we're we're riding this wave of, ooh, boundaries are good. Boundaries are going to solve all of our problems. Boundaries are going to fix all of our relationships. So if I just call something a boundary, then it's going to be okay and it's going to be unquestioned, right? And so, you know, that leads to you know, at best, just kind of hyper boundaried behavior, right? Where there's a lot of rigidity and there's no flexibility and there can be this sense of like, oh, I really have to protect myself from attack all the way up to just, again, boundaries being used as a bludgeon, right? You know, you didn't text me back. My boundary is I'm going to block you until you get better communication, right? I know that's a silly example, but I mean, we've seen some weird messed up stuff that people, you know, call Mm -hmm. a boundary, but that's not just unique to boundaries. It, like you said, it can be any communication framework, any communication tool, right? Like people can take the quote unquote right vocabulary for something and use it for nefarious means, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Something that I want to, it actually makes me think of body language, which is a question that I have. And I haven't made my way through the whole book. So if you start talking about body language and and I want to tie in digital communication as well, forgive me. Um, but I'm so curious because so much of our communication these days is like over text and over email. I got an email this morning that I was like, I need to go downstairs, mm. take some deep breaths, mm. and eat some oatmal before mm. I answer this because <laughs> I'm not happy. Um, but how does that factor into the tools, or is that something on your mind for future? So much of our communication, I think, is body mm-hmm. language, you know, tone of voice and things like that can get lost in yeah, translation. I have some thoughts, but with... why don't you take it first, Jace? Well, I was just going to say that that's actually something we address early on in the meta communication chapter about the Triforce is that while body language and tone of voice and things you know, are really important and do make up a significant, you know, a significant part of how we communicate with each other. It's not super reliable all the time because a certain tone of voice or a certain body language or a certain phrase might have a very different meaning to one of you because of how you grew up or your friend group or your family compared to someone else. And then when you go online or you're texting or whatever, you lose all of that. And so one of the things in this particular book, we really tried to emphasize being more explicit and not just relying on tone of voice or emoji or something to convey the nuance, but getting a little more clear uh, because we're so often missing it. You know, we're so often missing those other Mm. pieces. And if we're not in the habit of communicating more explicitly and clearly, then we can miss out on that and not even realize that this thing I just said, like that email it's very possible the person had no idea how that would come across to you, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't know their tone of voice. You don't know what they're like with their friends. You don't know any of that context, and there's no way you could. Right. Absolutely. That's such a good point. I, I kind of um, want to make a yeah. case on the other side of it because, yeah, I think we can all acknowledge there's so much lost over text. You know, being able to text and communicate digitally is so, so, so convenient 
but it doesn't always necessarily mean it's the best tool for the job in any given moment. I really like when we had Demona Hoffman on our show a few weeks ago that she said this about online dating, that it's, you know, it's like fast food, right? That like, we love the convenience and then we're not very happy when it doesn't make us feel very good afterwards. And I think the same thing about texting, right? Is like, yes, incredibly convenient that I can send you a text message about my thoughts and feelings about what happened last night while I'm still in the middle of my work day and then you don't have to respond to it right away, like super, super convenient. And also there's a cost that that conversation may not actually go very well or the way that I thought that it was going to because we're losing a lot over text. On the opposite side of it though, and I think that we talked about this maybe in the radar chapter, I don't remember. Sometimes there are certain topics or certain conversations where just sitting there staring into your partner's eyes can make it really difficult to talk about it. You know, you may be physically feeling too activated. You may be feeling too upset. Both of you may be getting each other worked up. And so sometimes I do encourage people to get creative in the way that they're communicating about something. If it's, hey, can we try texting about this while we're in the same house, but from opposite rooms, just so I can have a chance to like actually sit down, calm down a little bit, write out my thoughts, edit, tweak it, and then send it to you. And you have time to read it, digest it, think about it, then start responding to it. Like if doing that over text or over email helps the two of you to actually slow down the conversation and not be interrupting each other or not be activating each other in the same way, I say go for it. Now, of course, that's a situation where it's like if something really is misunderstood or if we're getting upset, we can still come back into the living room and hug each other if we need to, right? I wouldn't recommend this if you're at a distance. But I do think that getting creative and being open to text being a medium for situations where maybe it's just kind of hard to be communicating in real time when you need something that's slowing you down in that way. I think that can be a great solution as well. Mm, I, I love what you're sharing too, because it really just points to the fact again, that we all have different communication styles and it's all so nuanced and, you know, maybe like, Chewers and Spewers, for example, which is something that like the book wasn't the first time I'd heard it because I heard it on your show like ages ago, but I have forgotten. And just the the point that like maybe sometimes actually you are a spewer, which is like when you, you know, sharing a bunch of information out loud, it helps you work out your own problems um, for people listening. But in certain situations with other people, you might not be. And so it's like how you communicate is an exploration because how I communicate with my partner might be different than how I communicate with my mother or my boss. And so the cool thing is, and I think what your book really invites people to do is explore these different tools. You know, maybe every tool doesn't work for you, but you, you can pick and choose and you can really decipher like what's supportive in this container, in this context with this person, like this relationship. And, you know, for, For example, too, like going into separate rooms and texting, that's pretty brilliant. I've never even thought about it. Um, But I know for Pasha and I, when we have a challenging conversation, we we learned this just a few years ago. We go for a walk Mm -hmm. because us face to face sometimes is too intense. Like we want to cut each other off. I get really emotional. And when I get emotional, I can't think straight. And I am a spewer. So then I say things that I really don't mean. Or that like, I think I mean, but I'm like, wait, that doesn't sound right when it comes out. So when we start moving our bodies, there's something about the like physiology, maybe the psychology that actually like calms down the nervous system. And it's also like actively problem solving. That is so key for us. And I would say like, that's one of our biggest communication yeah. tools yeah. Um, in our relationship. So I think what your book really does is invites people to explore and to try things on for size, see how they fit. They don't work great, but also then to recognize, oh, this might be actually their way of communicating effectively with me. So that's the flip side of it too, that I think is like a hidden gift is like, we're not just learning this for ourselves. We are learning it to better understand the people that we love. Yeah. So hundred percent. if there's anything particularly special that I think comes out of non-monogamy or the history of modern day non-monogamy practices is I think there is this huge spirit of self-efficacy. There's this huge spirit of we can figure something out. And if you think about it, 
like that is pretty fundamental to practicing, figuring out how to practice non-monogamy in a landscape that's not really supportive to it, right? Like what you went through of like, we don't even feel connected to community or resources, but we're going to figure something out, right? Like, I guess we have the belief we can do it. And so we're going to figure it out, right? And so I do think that that sense of self-efficacy goes into a lot of these communication tools, right? Where I do think that in more traditional monogamous culture, historically, there's a little bit more of this disempowered sense of kind of like, well, if you got a good one, maybe it'll work out, right? If you're lucky enough to pick a good partner, maybe it'll work out. Or if maybe they shape up, then it'll work out. And so if anything, you know, I want the book to just help empower people to have that sense of, we have tools, we have options, we have things that we can try. But ultimately, at, at the end of the day, if none of these are a perfect fit, we can figure something out. We can try something on. We can experiment. We can build our own thing that works just for us, right? And so that's what I really want people to feel in their relationships is this sense of empowerment around their communication that we can work together as a team and create something wholly unique for ourselves if we have to. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It's like a, it's, you know, it's a, not a blank canvas. It's like, here are, here's this smorgasbord of options, you know, formulate the best thing for you and mm -hmm. your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I would love to maybe just hear from each of you before we wrap up, um, you know, if, if people aren't listening to your podcast already, highly recommend Multiamory. I think you've been in the game the longest out of anyone else and really consistent, just like beautiful episodes across the board for all relationship styles. Um, and also you spoke about your, um, your Patreon and your Discord. So you have an online community that you've created. And um, I know from reading this book that you also have plenty of resources that you have gone to over the years yourselves. And so I think what I want to ask is like, what, maybe you can share a bit of what things you're offering. It sounds like you do one-on-one -on -one coaching, mm -hmm. Dedeker. Um, or also if there's any other resources out there that you want to highlight that you think are valuable for other people. Just to kind of... Boy, what a big question. Yeah. What a big question. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I will say right out the gate, yes, I do coaching. So I work with individuals. I work with couples. I work with triads as well. So if people want to find out more about that, they can go to either multiamory.com slash coaching, or they can go to dedekerwinston.com to find out more about that. As far as other resources, that's, that's a big, that's a big question. I mean, part of why we created this whole chapter in our book, our extra tools chapter was to refer people to all of the incredible wisdom and tools from people other than us. So I think like it was so hard for me to narrow down to just one personally. Yeah, that's great though. So last chapter in the book is going to be Extra like tools. Mm, yeah. yeah, where we cover things mm -hmm. like NVC or basics of attachment theory, especially the way that attachment theory intersects with non-monogamy as explained by, you know, the amazing Jessica Fern or, or that was the one I was going to yeah, Oh, okay. So. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's in there. Check out. No, but yeah, check out Polly Secure because uh, we just talk about her heart's uh, model very briefly, but it's a great, that's a phenomenal resource. And I know Jessica is also coming out with a, another book in August as a companion book to that. So definitely check out yes. Jessica. And she's actually coming on to awesome. Open Late nice. this nice. month. So yes, yeah, we talk a lot too. about, yeah, yeah, amazing. That's definitely a highlight, uh, a book that we highlight a mm. lot on the show. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I would just reiterate again the importance of finding community and you know if if you either don't want to find one in person or you can't or you want something to supplement that then i would recommend you know checking out our patreon community or checking out checking out jessica's uh you said it's on whatsapp now but maybe it'll be discord in the future but like something like that that's structured around a podcast or a community that's trying to be very intentional about communication and that I think there's something really important about having it be a community that takes a little bit of extra work to join, right? Like having to be mm. part of a Patreon or, you know, something that's 
like a small amount of money to pay, but keeps kind of the random trolls out because they don't want to spend, you know, $5 a month or whatever it is on trolling people because they can do that a bunch of other places for free. So it just kind of makes yeah. the community a little more positive. <laughs> or if it's based around a podcast that focuses on healthy communication, you're just going to get a little better odds of having more positive, productive conversations there. And I'm sure you've seen that in your community as well. I just think that's that's such an important mm. thing that, and and I'm curious to hear what you have to say after doing your dinner party, but it's like when you <laughs> don't have it for a long time and then you do, it's kind of this like, oh my gosh, how did I ever live without this? Like, how did I get by without people to talk to about this in a place where I don't have to constantly be monitoring, wait, who knows about what partner, who, who can I tell what to just taking that like mental load off is amazing. Yeah. Well, that's, it's such valuable insight, a, a little bit of a barrier to entry. Um, and B got me even more excited for tonight. So it'll be like the first time I'm in a space like this where I am not hosting or well, mm -hmm. technically hosting <laughs> at my house. So that's weird, but I'm not facilitating right. the event. I'm not like, yeah, this is my podcast. I'm going to have a workshop or mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. I get to just be a community member, which even for, you know, people like us, I think is, is still yeah. so important. That's why we do what we do because we realize how important community is. Mm -hmm. um, so well, I appreciate you three so much, Jace, Emily, Dedeker. Thank you for coming on Openly and um, for everyone listening, make sure you get your copy of Multiamory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships. We will link it in the show notes, of course, and we will be talking about it a ton in the coming months of this show. Thank you. For thank you so you much do. for having us. Thank you so much. Well, that is a wrap on Emily Dedeker and Jace. Thank you so much for joining us and Multiamory this week. Oh my gosh. And if you haven't yet, go check out Multiamory Podcast. They are the best. Make sure you order their book. I am linking it in the show notes, Multiamory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships. All kinds of relationships, not just the non-monogamous ones. So you can get this for your family and friends. There's so many communication tools in here that you can even use like when you're talking to your parents. <laughs> so or your kids. Um, I love you all so much and I will see you back here next week. As always, take a moment to rate and review the show and make sure you're subscribed in all the places. I love you all. Stay sexy.